So, welcome. I'm Anthony. Uh, it's nice to see we have a huge crowd today. So, uh, welcome to Ethereum Meetup Poland. Um, I always ask who is the first time here. Could you raise your some hands? Okay. It's always nice to see some like a constant influx of new uh, <laughs> heads and faces. Um, so, Ethereum Meetup Poland, it's about e Ethereum. Uh, we meet every month, most of the time, to talk about nice things. So, um, just a very short agenda. We will have today two presentations. We will do a very, very, very short break in between the presentations. Afterwards, we will have a pizza. So, don't run away. It's really good to wait until the end. Um, so, that's it from my side. Today, we have uh, Maker joining us. So I will just pass on to Lenka and make some notes. Hi guys, uh, my name is Lenka Hudakova. I'm a community lead for Maker in Europe. I'm actually from Slovakia. My Polish is shitty, I apologize for it. Um, I'm based in Copenhagen office and I'm really happy to be here today to meet all of you and I have uh, some special treats but I'll speak about it later. I just want to introduce that uh, we will have two speaks uh, by MakerDAO because tonight is just MakerDAO event. Um, first one is Lev Linja. He will speak about, uh, he will give you a brief introduction into Maker system and also into all these um, economic incentives we have applied to the whole project. And uh, yeah, he's, he's pretty smart and he has some cool things to say. Um, yeah, I'm a bit nervous now. Okay, uh, he's an uh, economic research team and he's also like part of the team that does the formal verification, which is really cool because uh, as you will find out very soon, uh, MakerDAO is the first major dev that actually has uh, formally verified code. So he'll tell you about that. And then uh, we will have a die depth hour for whoever wants to stay and hang around. It will be at the place called, I can't remember in Polish what it's called, but I think in trans, yes, uh, exactly. Centrum Strvania Świata? Yes. Um, yes, so between nine and 10 o'clock, uh, we will be giving free drinks or literally uh, one drink will cost one die and I will have some die over here to give you. So afterwards, after the talks, find me and we'll get you set up. There's five die on each token. So I hope you join us. And because it's a pretty, pretty busy day at the place where we're going, it will be a special menu for the drinks. It will be the Polish independence uh, menu. So it will be red wine, white wine, uh, vodka, and beer for those who cannot tolerate either of those. So yeah. Let me give the uh, mic to Lev. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Here you go. Hello? Is, is this, is this loud enough? Yeah. Okay. See and hear everything properly? Uh, so thank you for coming today on this um, significant uh, public holiday, and um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, I would like to know, uh, firstly, uh, how many people here have heard of Maker or Die, or have some idea of how to, oh, amazing, okay, cool, okay. And how many people like understand actually how it works and they've thought about it before, or they've heard? Okay, that's, that's really good. Um, uh, so I would describe this as a, as a less technical talk, uh, n not, not in the sense that I'm going to explain what a blockchain is or anything like that, but it's less technical because I want to provide some motivation for why you would build a system like this in the first place and why you would make it like this and compared to some other idea. Um, and uh, what, is the, what is the economic basis to think that something like this should work or something like this should be uh, useful? <coughs> So actually, we'll spend most of the time discussing uh, what is uh, what is money, uh, because this is what cryptocurrency is actually uh, trying to do. It's mostly trying to solve a, uh, or you know play an economic role, and then actually the 
Um, the technical implementation of that is, of course, like what actually brought us all together and what we're all very interested in. But it's if we're doing something that doesn't actually make sense economically, then there's probably no um, nothing good will will come of it in the end. Um, and then I will, of course, actually talk about Dai. But um, I, really, I want to set the set the stage for a kind of e the correct economic understanding of it. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'd like to leave 10 minutes for questions. And in, in fact, um, I'd like to do an experiment. So if someone is, uh, is, 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 is listening to the talk and if you have some question or comment that you would like to ask, um, we'd like to wait till the end because we don't have, uh, we don't have loads of time to, to stop during the talk. But if you could wave or raise your hand for a few seconds to indicate that at this point you have some questions. Uh, this will help me measure enough time to leave at the end for questions. And also I'll know which parts of the talk were actually uh, generating questions so that I can maybe um, actually slow down at that point and say a bit more or other points I'll speed up because maybe no one is interested in this slide or some, something like that. So can we do that please? Just some wave or raise your hand for a few seconds just so I know roughly what kind of perfect. Okay, yes. Uh, exactly like that. Um, great. <clears throat> Um, so one problem with, uh, with, with trying to have a discussion about what is money is that money is a very, very abstract uh, concept, uh, which is you can't un really understand purely in, in technical terms. Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of competing uh, theories of what is, what is meant by money. And b basically, you know, this can be uh, either a debate about what is meant by the word money. So what do people um, mean when they say money? So this uh, is like a, basically an argument about definitions, um, but it can also be a, uh, an argument about uh, like an empirical argument. So, so what, what, what do we observe in the in the natural, well, in the in the in the human in, the, in human society? How what is the right approach to explaining the behavior of money? And this this sounds like you know you could say this about about anything, but actually with money, it's particularly um, particularly controversial. And in fact, a lot of people's uh, arguments, it turns out that you know, they're assuming some very specific theory of money and then they're basing a lot of their reasoning on, um, on this. So I would just like to deconstruct that without being particularly opinionated about which way is correct for now. Um, I think something in cryptocurrency circles that you hear a lot is medium of exchange. Um, and this is certainly what, um, what people discuss in the Bitcoin community, for example, they're, they're asking what is the utility of Bitcoin or why, what is Bitcoin for, or what makes Bitcoin money, and they say it's a convenient medium of exchange, uh, which is certainly true because there was a lot of innovations that went into creating something like that that could be transacted in this relatively trustless way that wasn't possible with other electronic cash systems. <clears throat> and uh, there are some communities that particularly fixate on medium of exchange as the correct and it was the, is the main theory of what money is. So people who are uh, into, into gold for various reasons, they're usually um, thinking about um, uh, money or, or, or in general like these, these types of valuable commodities as being something that we kind of agree should be uh, treated either as a medium of exchange or some kind of representation of value. And of course, like people, uh, a lot of people like gold, they're not actually planning to use gold as a medium of exchange, but they're still thinking that um, there's something about gold, which means we kind of choose it to be special over all the other resources, which so that we can designate that gold is a good store of value or, or something like that. Um, but as you can see, it's already a spectrum because some people, maybe they want to actually transact in gold and they think that commodity currency is the best way to transact. Um, also, Austrian economists uh, usually talk about medium of exchange and they see that the value that money has, it gets, gets its utility from being a useful medium of exchange and that the best money is the money that's the best medium of exchange and so on. Um, and uh, you know this this could be a commodity like 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 gold or, or you know something even more even more tangible like uh, like some food or some uh, uh, some some other metals or something. Um, but there's also this idea of a meme coin, um, which which I think gold is is a bit of both. Um, but but a meme coin is 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 this uh, concept that if we all kind of agree that something should be valuable, then even if it's not, if it doesn't have any other inherent purpose, then it actually gets value because if we all agree that it's valuable, then we get some utility out of it by being able to transact it. If there was no, nothing before that we could use for this purpose, then actually this, this resource somehow gets value out of nothing. Uh, and ex this, I mean, with, with Bitcoin, this is the, kind of the only, only claim it has, right? Because there, you literally can't use, you know, Bitcoins to, um, to do anything like, 
there's no industrial applications of, uh, of bitcoins other than you know just using it as a as a medium of exchange. Um, and then there's actually a completely different perspective on um, on money, and there's some uh, economic schools like chartalism and uh, MMT, modern monetary theory, um, which which says that money is actually like a like a legal or like an accounting mechanism that governments can use to carry out um, uh, government policy. So they focus on the fact that you know money is is basically is created. Uh, by, this, by the central bank in some sense, or the central bank has very tight control over how money is created. Um, and, um, and then kind of the, the governments can also destroy money by collecting taxes and then effectively this is taking money out of the supply. And because they probably, like legally, they have the right to create as much money as they want, this means that it's not even correct to view it as a resource because there's actually no scarcity. It's just pieces of paper or some kind of accounting unit that the government can bring in and out of existence all of the time. Um, and that really this is an accounting mechanism. So it's like, you know, the government has some spending that it wants to do for, you know, whatever government, government institutions or, um, or any kind of public infrastructure. Um, that's like, and, that's, and, then they collect it through, and then they collect money through taxes. And really this is just a way of balancing these two activities and that money is, not, um, is nothing other than that. And, or that this is the kind of correct fundamental uh, perspective of money. Those people, those people believe. And it's quite interesting and it's, it's, a, more, it's a more modern, um, school of thought, and I think all of these ideas have some um, some very very helpful perspectives. Um, but the last one that I'll talk about is uh, uh, money is credit, um, and this is uh, again different to the previous two, uh, in that uh, this says that money is something basically that is not necessarily created in a top down way by a, by a government. It's not. Um, it's not just about exchange, but it's actually something much more complex, that it's something that arises out of social agreements between people. Um, this, people who believe this theory also claim that this is very, very old uh, practice. Um, they claim that money as credit came about much, much, uh, uh, much before uh, money as, uh, as a medium of exchange or as commodity money, uh, and that really, you know, in very primitive, uh, very early civilization that people were interacting with each other they were um, starting to think about one person having a having a debt to someone else because if you cooperated with someone today there might you know there might be some expectation that you will cooperate with them tomorrow in such a way that you will kind of repay whatever your contribution was um, and uh, so I think this is kind of maybe the most like social um, theory about about money and it's the, the, maybe the most abstract um, compared to the compared to the previous ones, so mostly we'll talk about this one today. So far, I think no one has actually participated in the raising hands experiment. So, please, unless these parts were very very obvious, so please do feel free to do that, or actually uh, encourage you to do that. Um, so. Um, so there's there's quite a there's quite a good uh, kind of anthropological justification for this money as credit theory, uh, because if you uh, if you if you study the first um, uh, the first like uh, artifacts left behind by early civilization, um, for example, this uh, this tablet, uh, you'd see that there was markings of um, of uh, of, of uh, like records of, of commodities that presumably were being traded between people. And I guess our, the most popular explanation for why you would be recording this is actually because these things were debts. Um, because if you, uh, if you were lending people um, some, uh, some agricultural thing, for example, that you were producing, then you'd need to write it down because otherwise you would lose track of it. And that, that this means that it's not simply trade or just people storing things, but there must actually be debts involved because otherwise there wouldn't be as strong a need to write it down. And this is a really cool, um, this is a really cool example, right? Because actually, you get example. Here's like a picture of the thing that, that, that presumably that they're um, that is owed. They've got little tallies, so you've got kind of the n numbers emerging here. And I mean, this is basically some of the earliest writing that's ever been um, discovered, right? So you got you got numbers and mathematics basically coming out of here. Another cool thing is that there's also some kind of rudimentary authentication going on because these little holes, um, that's like um, they would have these little little balls made of. Uh, uh, made of made of clay, which we get imprinted into this thing, and then the this gets kind of recorded in some central location, like some central database, and then people would get the little 
balls that formed the imprints and that they could actually, they presumably could actually transact with and carry with them and this was like a basic form of, of currency. But then later when you wanted to check if it was legitimate, you can actually come back here and then see if it fits into this imprint. And if it did, that means this was like a, like a legitimate debt that was you know, issued against this, uh, this commodity. Um, so this is, I mean, th this interpretation is really quite, um, uh, you know, quite exciting from a kind of historical anthropological point of view. Um, and the other things in support of this is that it seems to be quite close to how um, businesses think of think of money. So, uh, you know, there's all this, you know, pretty standard um, terminology about how to reason about, you know, making decisions about investments. Um, and you you know you discount the value of uh, the present value of money in the future. So you you know that you can productively invest money, and that um, it seems like m most of the language that's used to, um, to describe. Um, uh, uh, currency is actually heavily tied with uh, comparing the value of, of currency today and, and in the future. Um, and and it's, it seems to be much less about um, medium of exchange. Uh, you, you, don't, you, you usually don't reason about things like investments and, um, and business in medium of exchange uh, terms. <coughs> uh, and also what's convenient is that uh, credit money is, is, is literally how money is created in, in the modern economy, as I'll show you in the next, uh, in the next slide. Uh, so, actually, uh, could, could I have a show of hands for who has a, feels like they have a good idea of how money is, comes from in the modern economy, like what is, where is money coming from? Cool. Um, a lot of, because a lot of people, it's such a f basic, you know, fundamental uh, topic, but a lot of people have never thought about it before. Um, so there's something called base money, um, which consists of like notes and coins, like actually phys physically, um, physically printed or coined money that you can transact with. Uh, and there's uh, uh, deposits with the central bank, which is um, like a special type of bank account that banks are allowed to have. Um, no, one, no one other than banks is allowed to have this kind of, uh, kind of deposit. Um, and that's considered to be like kind of proto money. So, you know, a, a, some American bank will have like a deposit with the Federal Reserve. Um, just in the same way that an individual or a firm would have a deposit with a normal commercial bank. Um, and there's also uh, broad money, which is a much, much bigger um, set of, uh, of types of money. Uh, and this is also called like M1 or M2 or M3 or M4, depending on uh, the precise sort of, of money it is, or it's also referred to as commercial bank money. Uh, and this is what most people actually uh, interact with. So this is your deposit with a bank. And what it turns out is that actually that has a completely different origin, a completely different status to notes and coins, and a different status to this, um, this, this class above it, the, the deposits with the central bank. It's actually a different sort of money. So it, it, it's, it comes about in a different way, and the quantities of, of, of these different types of money that are present in the economy are actually completely different, um, as I'll see in the next slide. So I, I just gave names of two papers here where if this sounds really new or confusing or you don't believe what I'm saying, then I recommend taking a look because they explained it in very clear terms and a lot of people have found that this was the first time they understood how, how money works. So this is a graph of um, different, uh, these different types of money in the, in, in the case of the, the, the Bank of England, so in the, the United Kingdom. Uh, and the first one is, uh, and this is a graph of the, the total supply that was measured you know, th since the 60s. Um, this golden one is, um, is notes and coins. Uh, so you can see this is the smallest. Uh, this, is in, this is in billions, so you can see there's probably like only a couple of billion in, uh, uh, in notes of coins today, or maybe you know, just, under, just under 100 billion uh, pounds, British pounds, um, that are in notes and coins. And then we have you know, substantially more of it is in, um, is in this green one, which is, uh, which is this monetary base M0, which was, is deposits with the, um, with the central bank. So these are commercial banks have a bank account with a central bank. So here you can see today there's you know something like 400 billion pounds uh, in that form, but now vastly greater than either of those is um, is is broad money. So this is money that's uh, that people have as, as uh, bank accounts with the uh, uh, with with, com with with commercial banks, uh, and you can see how it's you know well basically like you know something like five times as um, as much as is in that. So how, where does that 
how does that appear? Where does that come from? Um, that money is, is created uh, when banks uh, issue loans. So uh, the main activity of a bank is to, um, people come to it for loans, they're looking for credit, they want to do some kind of productive investment or buy a house or whatever, and the bank will create money to give to them as a, as a loan. And what most people don't understand is this money is actually created at the time when the, when, when, when the loan is issued. Uh, banks aren't just lending, m lending out money that someone else has deposited. Um, otherwise, this wouldn't make sense, right? Because there, there simply wouldn't be there simply wouldn't be enough of it. So what's actually going on is every time the bank extends a loan, it's actually um, bringing new money into existence, creating it in its in its accounts, and then uh, transferring it to the person who wants to get the loan. Um, and the thing that I showed in red here. <laughs> was the measured amount of uh, bank and building society credit. So this is if you just summed all of the loans that, uh, that banks have outstanding at a, at a given point in time, you'd get this red line. And it's a little bit different to the blue line just because of like, differences in how you measure things or maybe something to do with different countries or where the bank accounts are. Um, or domicile. I'm not really sure why, why it's different. But basically, what I'm trying to show you is proof that this is indeed actually where most of the money comes from, is uh, the blue line is uh, the, basically the sum of all uh, commercial bank deposits, so if you took everyone's uh, bank accounts and you just summed up all of the money that was in there, um, you'd get something that's almost the same as, um, as all of the uh, outstanding loans that all of the banks have issued. Um, and this is, to a lot of people, like, very surprising. So I think this is probably the most compelling kind of empirical evidence that there's something to this credit theory of money because it appears that this is where um, this is where money is actually coming from in the most part, even though we do have a little bit which is created in a different way. Okay, good, this is generating some kind of response. <laughs> this is a good, good sign. Okay, so now I'll say, explain what the die credit system is. Um, I think it's actually very simple. A lot of people think that it's extremely complicated, and what's true is that there are some complicated mechanisms that are needed to, um, to implement certain, certain features. Um, but I think at its core, it's actually, it's actually very, very simple, and it's almost like the simplest uh, thing that, uh, that you could do, given what I just said about uh, where money comes from. Um, so it's, I mean, it's similar to like, you know, I'm, I'm, like, I'm sure there's a lot of like complex software that goes into, um, goes into the functioning of a normal bank, right? Like they've got probably, you know, thousands of lines of code just to, hundreds of thousands of lines of code probably just in an ATM, and then there's all kinds of different systems and all kinds of markets, and they're all, everything is, is electronic. Um, but the, that doesn't mean the core mechanism has to be complicated to understand. So this is the claim I'm making, is that if you've heard a lot of complicated things about Maker, and you will hear, you will hear more, and a lot of it is really fascinating, but um, I think the core mechanism should be really simple to understand. Um, so DAI is created as, uh, as debt. Uh, so any user, it's a completely permissionless system. Um, can come and they can pledge some valuable asset uh, as collateral, and they can generate die against it. Uh, into very, very similar interaction to how loans are created by by commercial banks. Um, and this debt has to be paid back later. Uh, and this position is called this. The situation is called a CDP. Uh, so, when a user interacts in the system in this way, they they get what's called a, a collateralized debt position. Uh, and then actually the most important thing about, uh, about all of this in order to make it work um, is the maker community has to govern the system well. So in this, in this exchange, they have to decide you know, which assets uh, should, have been, should have been allowed to participate. So clearly if a user is coming with some asset which actually has no value or which is extremely, extremely risky or the value is just extremely uncertain and no one can really decide um, if it's worth anything, then it's probably a bad idea to, uh, to allow this to happen. Um, they have to decide how much die to lend to a, to a person who's trying to pledge a particular asset. Um, and again, it seems like this should be, this should be dependent on the, um, on the value of the asset that they're bringing. Um, and also they have to decide what to do, you know, if this asset loses value. We initially thought that this was a good asset, it turned out later that it was a bad asset, or at least it's becoming riskier and we need to somehow readjust our position. Um, sometimes we need to intervene and actually actively do something. And this is where a lot of the more complicated um, stuff comes into play. And, uh, and lastly, uh, you know, the, 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 the system needs to be governed in such a way that, um, uh, that the, the, the die that's created through this credit um, maintains its stability. Because probably 
uh, most of the users of the system, they will find the system more useful if the, if the die is stable. Um, so governance also has to decide on monetary policy, which is like a, a plan for how, how they will act in order to, um, in order to exert the right influence on the, on the value of, of die. And what's very important is that governance is incentivized to act uh, correctly in these situations. Um, it's it, you, the, the, probably one of, the, one, of the, one of the biggest dangers is a situation where um, there's either some kind of perverse incentive or, um, or, or moral hazard or, or conflict of interest where, uh, or just simply a lack of incentive. So somewhere where governance isn't really participating and isn't really paying attention. Um, Oh, and I'll, I'll just say a few things here which are maybe fairly obvious by this point. Um, I think for, if you subscribe to this credit theory of money, then it's clear that you know, money is like an emergent phenomenon of human cooperation through time, and it's not a purely, it's, 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 not, it's not a purely technical piece of infrastructure. Um, but what this means is that you probably can't make good money purely through um, some kind of self-contained, purely self-contained system of some, 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 just, some, just some technical protocol that doesn't actually interact with the outside economy in any way. Um, and ma this is maybe um, shocking if, you're, if, you, th if you, you know, really believe in something like uh, uh, gold um, or Bitcoin, because um, with, 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 those, with those things, like there's nothing about gold which really like knows about what's going on in other parts of the world, right? And this is ultimately the reason why a lot of countries moved, most countries moved off of the gold standard. Um, likewise, with Bitcoin, there's nothing, there's no input into the Bitcoin uh, protocol that uh, changes, you know, changes the, the, the kind of monetary evolution of the, of, of the protocol based on what's going on in the real economy. So it's, those systems are somehow very, very self-contained, which I think to, um, to technical people is very appealing because uh, it makes it seem like it's much simpler and easier to understand. They don't need to worry about external... Um, economic problems, uh, but my claim is that this actually ha is, is very difficult to, to, to get it to work, and that uh, an important component of, of good money is that it has to uh, have a really close connection with what's going on in the real economy, just like um, the money that we use today does. Um, and this is why, you know, so much of this is actually about, about governance, and it's about these really challenging questions um, about what is, what is the risk of an asset, and um, what, is the, what is the correct monetary policy and so on. Um, so, so I'll answer some, some like, p possible kind of frequently asked questions that, um, that come out of this discussion. So uh, the first point is, you know, when you're, when you're issuing uh, DAI uh, through these CDPs, you will issue less DAI than, you know, you think that the asset that's being pledged as collateral is worth. Uh, otherwise, I mean, this, you know, clearly like falls apart as a, as a permissionless system, like how, how would you how, how would you possibly allow um, like strangers on the internet to take to basically take out more um, uh, more more value than they've than they've pledged because then they could just kind of all show up anonymously and um, ask to borrow a lot of die and then you'll never see them again. Um, so uh, it's obvious that this has, that the system is is over uh, collateralized, but. Uh, but to a lot of people, this seems like, oh, well, then no one will want to use this, or this is very capital inefficient, or this doesn't make sense. Why would you want to uh, bar? Why would you want to pledge as collateral more in value than you're um, than you're borrowing? Uh, but actually, this isn't this isn't a problem at all, because um, this is how how ordinary lending works. So, um, you know, in, in one form or another, when someone is is lending you something, they have to have um, they have to have some um, they have to have some recourse. Which could be uh, literally collateral. Um, for example, like if you're uh, if you're if you're getting a mortgage or something, then you'll you'll never be the value of your mortgage that the bank gives you will never exceed the value of the house that's being pledged as collateral, unless there's actually some extra collateral available somewhere. Um, so, for example, if you want to buy a house that costs like you know, 100,000 euros, you have to put down some some cash yourself, and then um, the bank will provide you with let's say like you know 50,000 euros or or seventy thousand euros, or something, depending on the type of loan. But they're never going to give you, um, they're never going to give you more value than the value of the than the value of collateral that you've pledged, because otherwise it's just it's completely irresponsible. Um, and uh, and and this is similar. And what I was trying to show with these previous graphs about um, about how money in the uh, in the real economy comes about 
uh, is, to, is to convince you that we should actually compare this money creation process to what's going on in the real economy, where we find out that, um, uh, that this is actually a sensible way to, to originate money. Um, and then a, a question is like, so how, will, uh, how will the monetary policy work in this, in this case? So for example, um, uh, how, do we, how do we make sure that, uh, that we, can keep, uh, we can keep the die stable? Um, well, the, the MKR government firstly has a very strong incentive to find the right approach to, um, to get this to work. Of course, that doesn't explain how it happens. Um, but the reason is that you know users really want price stability on both sides. So users who are holding DAI because they're using it to just do some transactions, just like you use your bank account to do transactions normally, um, they want this DAI to have um, to have some notion of stability. And what what is meant by stability is also, I guess, sort of controversial. But they certainly want something like that. Um, and also, the people who are borrowing also want stability. So no one wants to no one wants to borrow in some asset where they'll have some liquidity problems at the end in order to uh, to pay back their loan. Um, the, the thing that affects the price of DAI in the market is the combination of supply and demand. So, like, so the supply is coming from credit, so people who are borrowing, and demand is coming for people who are using DAI for exchange or for some kind of, um, some kind of, some kind of uh, you know, in, interactions. Um, and the goal of, of monetary policy is, um, is to decide on a target uh, and then use the available policy levers to, um, to meet it. Uh, so the the tools that are available is they can they can change the interest rates on borrowing, so they can make borrowing more or less attractive. They can add or remove assets that are that are accepted as collateral, so they can you know vastly expand the um, the credit capabilities of the system by finding new assets that users can borrow against, or you know remove them likewise. Um, and they can do actually many many other things. Um, and uh, and the goal ultimately is to. If, if there are changes in, uh, in supply or in demand for whatever reason, so for example, if the economy is having a recession, then you expect uh, maybe, maybe uh, credit demand um, is, is decreasing, or if the economy is, is really heating up, then credit demand is increasing because more and more people want to borrow. Uh, and likewise, stuff can happen on the, on the demand side. Um, and, uh, and the goal is to respond to these shocks by, um, by, adjusting, by adjusting something. Um, and another question is, you know, what about bank runs? So something that can happen in, uh, with normal commercial banks is, uh, so, so the normal commercial bank doesn't actually have enough, enough, of these, uh, enough of this base money. So in this graph, we had coins and notes and central bank reserves. Uh, those are the things that it can actually use to kind of give you your money back if you want to, uh, if you want to withdraw your, your deposits. Um, the, the, a normal bank won't actually have enough of that because as we saw in this graph, there's vastly more in, um, in commercial bank deposits than there is in, uh, in base money. So if everyone wanted to take their money out of all the banks, then there just pro wouldn't be enough coins and notes and central bank deposits to, um, to redeem everyone, um, even though the assets are there. So the bank has all these valuable, valuable assets in the form of loans and so on, um, but there's just not this liquidity. Um, and this has been a huge, huge problem historically because the thing about bank runs is like it's, a, it's basically a game theoretic instability because you, you, you suspect that there might be a bank run, then um, uh, so you suspect that other people might want to take their assets out, then even if everything is fine with the bank, um, it actually doesn't matter because if other people take their, take, take their, take their cash out, there won't be any left, left for you and no one wants to be exposed to that kind of uncertainty. Um, so then it, your incentive is to take your money out before everyone else does. So it basically just creates this race which is really um, damaging because it can actually come out of nothing. It's like a, it's like a, uh, you know, a positive feedback loop. Um, and we actually have a very, very powerful, and, and a similar thing could happen with, um, with something like DAI, right, is because uh, a lot of people are holding DAI, uh, and then they become concerned that there could be some bank runs. So they heard some rumor, or they're just, they, they just think that, you know, for some reason people would want to get out of this asset. Um, and this is a huge problem for a lot of things in cryptocurrency, actually, because Bitcoin absolutely has a bank run problem. Because if you start to suspect that people might in the future not believe that Bitcoin is a good medium of exchange for whatever reason. It could be technical reasons, like there's some competitor that has better technical properties, or there's you know, some kind of problem with, well, many things can go wrong. If you suspect that, um, you'll want to get out of Bitcoin. But even if you don't even believe that, if you think that other people will believe that, you should probably get out of Bitcoin first. So of course, there's always this counteracting effect, which is people are speculating and they're hoping that also there's a chance it's gonna go up and people are trying to buy the dip or whatever. Um, but it's actually a huge, uh, huge instability. Um, so if you, th this should make almost anyone uncomfortable um, 
with the risk that they're exposing themselves to, because even if everything is actually great, um, other people losing confidence can very quickly create like a rational um, bank run, like where everyone is, is, is acting rationally, but they're just afraid that someone else might be, uh, might be worried, so they, they should get out first. Um, and we actually have a very powerful uh, backstop for this, which is, which is really nice. Uh, it's called uh, uh, Global Settlement. So it's, it's basically like analogous to liquidating this whole bank. You can, um, you can do the same thing that happens when a, um, when a normal commercial bank needs to get liquidated. You, um, you, you basically take the bank's assets and you just hand them out to, um, to the creditors. And as long as the system was solvent, so as long as we had enough assets, which we almost always should, um, then people know that in the end, the worst thing that could happen is they're going to be able to get some of the, some of the assets out of the system. Uh, and then, because they know that this will happen, the, this, is like, this is a backstop, and this would prevent them from panicking in the first place. Or there's a, there's a, good, there's a pretty good chance that they'll, they'll be less worried than, um, than if there was you know, absolutely no recourse for them in that event. Um, so anyway, this all raises some very interesting research questions. Um, I've highlighted four here. The first one is monetary policy. Um, so we're, you know, we're looking into some credible algorithmic approaches to monetary policy, for example. Um, the most important things about monetary policy is credibility. So everyone kind of needs to know exactly what the plan is and um, that other people understand what the plan is so that we don't, there's no kind of information asymmetries or um, kind of problematic expectations. Um, another really important thing is tokenization. So you can get real efficiency gains from, from you know, using CDPs in existing um, business models in the, in the real economy, for example. Um, and there's a lot of new economic activity that becomes possible with the blockchain that we can uh, play a really important role in and unlock, basically, by, um, by using CDPs and DAI. Um, another really important thing for us is high assurance software engineering. So when you're building something that's uh, that this, this fundamental, um, you need basically the highest assurances that you can have that your code is doing what everyone thinks it's doing, um, which is why we've been kind of leading this, this space in terms of like practical smart contract formal verification. So I recommend you check out these. Um, these things are come talk to me if you want to know more about that. Um, and lastly, is like oh, just in general, decentralized financial technology, right? Um, uh, things like decentralized exchange and, and auctions and um, how, how people will participate in the financial markets when they're um, kind of uh, based on this new infrastructure. Um, cool. Um, now I'd like to do some questions. Uh, yeah, and we have a microphone, so... Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, can you raise your hand so the microphone will get to you? It was a while ago uh, when I waved, so I had to uh, think hard to remind myself of my question. It was about the graph. Uh, it seemed that uh, this, um, um, the, the difference between the baseline and, 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 and the money uh, is quite recent. This is just the second half of the uh, 20th century. What's, what's the reason behind it? Why is it so recent phenomenon? Oh, so uh, I mean, one problem is that this is a this is a linear scale graph. If I put I could put this on a log scale so that you could actually see what's going on here. I mean, obviously, this doesn't mean that everything was zero before 1970. This is just on a smaller scale. Um, if you zoomed into this, you'd get approximately the same the same picture. It's, it's pretty general, um, like phenomenon. It's not something. Yeah, no, no, no. This, this is, no, it's, it's not like something was something really substantially changed in 1975. I mean, it. Uh, you could ask, like, what is the what is the ratio of this to this through history, and that has changed a lot. And things like um, uh, being on the gold standard or being on the bimetallic standard, and then going off of that completely has affected that a lot. And there's a lot of interesting history here. Um, in fact, you can look at these graphs going back to the 17th century or something. Um, but no, no, there wasn't some. This this all existed for a long time, so this wasn't. Um, this is a little bit misleading because of the scale. Uh, yep. You said that uh, this over collateralization is exactly how credit system uh, works. And I would like to challenge you on that. Um, uh, that is not true. Uh, when you put the collateral in a bank, uh, like when you uh, do a mortgage on your uh, property, on your um, real estate, you can still use this real estate. Uh, but. Uh, when in, in the way this, the die works, you need to put up money, uh, another another uh, another currency. So, uh, if you would like to compare your system to traditional credit system, you would need to compare it with somebody who puts like 
uh, $1,000 to his bank account to uh, borrow from it a less, uh, lesser amount. It doesn't make sense uh, unless you are allowed to use your collateral at the same time. Yeah, th this is a good, this is a good question. You, you are in the po possession of the collateral. Yeah, and actually you, you are um, in, in many ways, uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll, there's two points here. So one is that would you be able to use this asset while it was in a CDP? And the answer is that you, know, you should, abs to the extent that, this, you, that you can use this asset at all, you probably should be able to use it in a CDP. So for example, if we were tokenizing houses and real estate and putting them into CDPs in order to do mortgages um, on the blockchain through, through, through Maker, um, you would absolutely be allowed to use it your house or use your house as a business or um, you, you know, develop this property or whatever you would do with the, with the normal mortgage. The only thing that the bank will stop you from doing is something that will like, has a chance of damaging the value of the property so much that, um, so even with a mortgage, you do have ownership of your house, but there's a lien on, 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 this, on this asset, which means that it's kind of becomes, the ownership of it becomes more complex. Um, but absolutely the same should apply here. So if we had houses on the, uh, tokenized on the blockchain, we would definitely allow people to live in them, but subject to some, some of the normal rules, that, some sensible rules that you have uh, today. Um, but there's another important thing, which is that uh, even if this is not an asset that you can get utility from, like, a, um, like some commodity or a, or, a, or a factory or a mine or a, or a house or whatever, um, you, st you still uh, retain ownership of it when it goes into a CDP. Most importantly, the... Um, uh, the, the value of you know, appreciation or depreciation of this asset, you're still directly exposed to. Um, it's not like you're, um, you know, when you, when you repay, your, when you repay your, your position and you take this asset out, you get the same quantity of this asset as you put in. You don't get just, you know, re repaid the initial, you know, dollar value of the asset. Um, which means that if you're putting ETH in a CDP, it's not the same thing as, you know, transferring someone, um, you know, $100 and then getting $50 out and then later you just, pay it back and get $100 back. That's obviously a pointless uh, interaction. If you put ETH in a CDP, uh, you can borrow against it, but when you close your position, you get the same amount of ETH out, um, which means that, you know, and also the, the ownership of the ETH, the, the, from an accounting point of view, the, the ownership of the asset is yours. It just simply has a, has a lien on it. Um, but this means that the, the value of this position um, will appreciate when, if, 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 the, if the underlying asset appreciates and it will depreciate if, you, if the asset goes down, um, which, is, which is important because people will have a, for example, who have a, like an investment portfolio of assets and they want to borrow against this to get some short-term liquidity, but they don't want to lose those assets as, as investments, um, they still benefit from, um, they can still benefit from this uh, without, without sell selling the assets by using, by using CDPs. And there's, a, I mean, there's a, lots of people in the, um, there's a huge industry in the traditional financial space where people are borrowing against some investment portfolio of assets um, as a way of getting leverage when they're when they're trading, or just as a way of you know f getting short-term liquidity or, or financing their their cash flows as an approach to, to treasury management or whatever. Um, this is very very common, and this has the same effect. So I'm saying is that essentially, if there's utility that you can directly extract from the asset, you should still be able to do that as long as it doesn't endanger the value of the of the collateral. And secondly, um, if there's like investment utility only in the asset and it's not something you can actually use, um, then you also benefit from that. So really, there's not. Um, so really, it's kind of the same as, as something like a mortgage. I'd say it is not, uh, because uh, you need you would need uh, to reinvent banking on uh, on blockchain. Uh, the uh, the whole point of uh, putting up uh, collateral in the form of real estate is that you need to um, uh, estimate its value. Uh, you need all the legal stuff uh, that. You've, you've got those rights to, uh, the, the uh, owner is not uh, allowed to sell uh, to sell the thing. Uh, he needs to uh, put up uh, to, to buy insurance and uh, stuff like that. So if you really think that uh, this is the way that die will work, you would need to reinvent the uh, the essence of banking. The, the people, the die community, would need to act like like a bank, actually. I think from from the point of view of um, from the point of view of risk management, um, that's in in some sense I think that I, I agree with that. I think it's true. Um, there's a there's not the question of how you organize, um, incentivize people so that they would kind of provide this value that that banks provide. Um, but I mean, this is essentially true, and it's true even without going to mortgages. It's true for for Ether, for example, um, that. 
in order to judge the risk of this asset, you need to essentially think like a like a banker. So you need to decide what is what risk are you exposing yourself to by using this as collateral. So let me suggest to invite you to the hour where we can finish this discussion off. How about that? I think the, we have to move on with the next uh, next talk. But uh, if you're finished with your slides, thank you. I yeah. think then we can just like take the discussion more informal at the at the venue that I cannot remember. <laughs> thank thank you, you so much. For cool things. So the first cool thing is that uh, many of Maker people are based in Europe. So for example, Lemka came here from Copenhagen. Uh, left from London, that's the first cool thing. So these people are not very far away, somewhere like in the US or so. The second cool thing is that many of Maker people are actually based in Warsaw because we have a Warsaw office. So everyone else here who's from Maker is from the Warsaw office. So we can reach out, with, uh, reach out to them with some questions or anything else you have. Um, <clears throat> the next cool thing, um, uh, I mentioned four things. So. The next one is that actually Maker Office uh, is very engaged in the Warsaw and Polish community. And one thing that, we done, that we've done recently is setting up Blockchain Hub Warsaw, an organization together with a few other leading blockchain projects in Warsaw. So that's another reason to reach out to us and talk, especially if you are doing something uh, cool in blockchain in Warsaw or in Poland in general. And the last cool thing I have is that Pizza is over there. Um, uh, and also, except pizza, you can get some dye from Lenka uh, to be spent later on, like for whatever you want, but later on uh, for some beer or other drinks or whatever else at uh, Centrum Zarzania Świata. Thank you, Eczek. Thanks, everyone, and let's enjoy the pizza. Come to me if you want some dye, and uh, yeah. Um, Thank you for coming, and yeah, networking, and then we go to beer.